think it's only fair to start out by, by confessing that this is long-term data that I'm going to be working on. And of all the people who've had permanent staff positions there and worked on it, I'm the one who's been there for the least amount of time. So I'm theoretically the least qualified person to talk to you about the history of Ohio Lakes Fisheries. But I would like to acknowledge people by whom we'd be better served if they were here, including John Forney, who was the first director of the station, started the program in 1957, which we have tried to adhere to and respect since then, followed by Ed Mills, as the second director in the limnologist there, and, and now Mark Rudstamp, who took over John Forney's position. The locals called 40 years the good old days, I think partly because that was when the Wallach population was harvested, but probably a thinly veiled commentary on the quality of work that people who followed 40 years have done in terms of protecting the fisheries. You see all that. In terms of staff, we have Tony Vandenbach and Tom Brooking, who have been there for essentially forever, working on fish, and Kristen Hollock, who's a long term person working on technology. So a lot of people have put a lot of time into this. So this is going to be a little different than the other talks. We're not talking about species. We're worried about getting into the lake and what we're going to do to stop them. We're talking about a lake that's full of invasive species and, and what we think they've done to the lake. And in an hour or so, when I finish and get to the tail end of the talk, I'm going to get a little philosophical and, and ask a couple of questions that, that, that I think challenge us a little bit. Because when we talk about restoring systems from the impacts of invasives, it implies that we know what it is we're aiming for in the restoration. It suggests that we know what the natural state is, so the pristine state. And often we don't know that. So we say we've got this odd stuff in here, we don't like it, we want to get rid of it, so the lake will be like it used to be, but we don't have good data on what it used to be. Well, night is a bit of an exception. We have a pretty good track record. Because it was in Central New York, the primary travel route from the coast to the Great Lake, so we have lots of journals and stuff to tell us what's going on there in the open. And we can look at what the fisheries were like and how they've developed through the years and assess what role invasive species have played in that. So we know that we don't have to worry about what the lake was like before 12,000 feet, you know. It was a big chunk of ice, so we're not going to worry about that. It was part of Lake Iroquois when the glacier started to recede, along with Lake Ontario. It, that's special because the other Great Lakes are colonized by fish coming up the Mississippi River, but because of this particular drainage pattern, Lake Ontario and Oneida were colonized by fish coming up the Atlantic Coast, which has implications for what the, what the fish fauna there were initially. We have archaeological data from the, the natives using the, the area and the fisheries before we got there and started mucking around it that, that suggested that the fish were very important. I've, I've made the argument that, that at least for the Oneida Nation, part of the Lake Iroquois, that the fish were equally as important to some of the Great Lakes tribes that we normally think of as depending on the fish. These were fish. They dried fish, they fished under the ice, they traded fish with other members of the nation for, for goods, which means this was instrumental to their economy and their sustenance. And we find some indication of what the native species in the lake were, things that we, we know about and still have their droves like the catfish, bite, and bass, sunfish, and bowfin. Not surprisingly, because this is archaeological work and, and bones that are 800 years old, these are species who have structures that are pretty easily identified. We don't get a better idea of the diversity of fish there until Europeans start to move into the area. And Andrew Vanderkamp, who came from, from the Netherlands, when he got into the little political hot water at home, he thought that migrating to the United States would be a good idea. So he our first European invasive into the area. And, and he was quite impressed by the lake and rattled off a long list of species that he saw, salmon, trout, pike pickerel, zob, which apparently translates to flounder. That's not one that we've seen in our sampling time. But but quite a diverse group of fish that he was very impressed with. And one of the things he noticed, and every person who traveled to the area and kept a journal noticed, was that the salmon were the <coughs> key part of the Native American fisheries. We had Atlantic salmon spawning runs up through the lake from Lake Ontario, through the, the St. Lawrence. Some arguments we made that we had year-round resident salmon in our lake because we had fisheries that function in spring, winter, and summer. And they speared them at night with, with fires up on the front of canoes. I think somebody talked about this technique earlier in the Lake Chautauqua talk. I think that was the method they used. But people were quite impressed by that. And the other fish that was very important to the natives was the, the American eel. They built weirs at both the inlet and outlet of Oneida Lake, catching the salmon going upstream and the eel going downstream. And, and those were very important fisheries. <coughs> Perhaps one of the best descriptions we have of the undisturbed natural history of central New York comes from DeWitt Clinton, who traveled through the area in 1810 and, and subsequently published his, his journals of those travels, which tells us a lot about the fisheries in the area, the wildlife, the lions and tigers and bears, all kinds of stuff going on that we don't have anymore. And, and he kind of confirmed that throughout the pre-European history of the lake, the most important 
fish species for the local fisheries for the Atlantic salmon in the American East. But it turns out Clinton was not motivated just by taking a hike and writing a book about it. He, he was exploring a potential route for a canal. He subsequently became governor of New York State. He got sidetracked briefly in a court case where the state was trying to, to prove that whales were fish and therefore their oil subject to inspection and state taxes. And it uh, tells you that the, the New York government has not changed that much. <laughs> you can record it. That's so sad. <laughs> He then built the canal, so, so in an irony that only a politician could miss, he gives us the best description after history of the state the central area and then puts in place the, the, the very thing that, that changed it irrevocably, which was, of course, the Erie Canal, which opened in 1825. Initially, Oneida Lake was not part of the canal system. It bypassed it. The Oswego River improvement was in 1827, and Oneida became central to the canal system in, in 1917. We call this now, of course, the Invasive Species Highway. And we have the, the salmon and the eel, which, which drove the fisheries, both of which have to migrate in order to spawn. Canals, of course, mean dams and locks, and that has always proven an impediment to fish trying to move up and down stream freely. So we, we essentially have taken the, the initial fisheries, that, the species that supported the lakes fisheries for well over 800 years, and got rid of them in a matter of about 20 or so years after we were describing them. In the early 1900s, Syracuse University scientist Adam Hankinson explored the lake and described it. It's not familiar with what people view know about Lake guess today. It's a shallow, very weedy lake surrounded by extensive swampy areas. When asked the local angler association and several people around the, around the lake what the most popular sport fisheries were, smallmouth bass was number one by a good bit. If you read fishing journals from that from that era, if, if you wind up getting that board. It's surprising that given this is the premier walleye lake in the state, that bass were the most popular and most talked about, but not surprising given the kind of habitat that they Lots of literal habitat, lots of vegetation, and that kind of thing. Walleye were still important, and I'm not diminishing their, their role in the lake, but, but the bass were, were, were the big player back in those days. So the next thing we did was we took the, the first dam at the outlet and, and turned it into a, a flood control device and essentially turn on my lake into a reservoir. We now control water levels, lower them every, every fall in order to keep the ice off of people's property and, and create a catch pool for melting snow so landowners won't be, be flooded. We drain most of the swamps around the lake to turn them into places where the landowners could build their houses that would not be flooded because we're controlling the water levels. And, and ironically, this area where we built this flood control mechanism is called noise is where that is, and that's actually our, our own version of it. Onondaga work for a place known for eels. It's of course not known for eels anymore because they're essentially gone. So we've taken this system and, and changed it in, in huge ways. Sorry about that. And turned it into the lake that everybody has in their mind now. When we talk to the local stakeholders, they say, oh yeah, that's the walleye lake. But it turns out the lake's conditions actually were not, not consistent with being a great walleye lake back in the old days. Not actually that consistent being a great walleye lake in the early 1900s. It was not until we started controlling water levels, which of course inadvertently controls vegetation. We all know that in farm management manuals. If you, if you expose vegetation before the wintertime, it dies back and doesn't grow. So we shift a lot of productivity from the littoral zone to the pelagic zone, and that created the conditions that supported the huge walleye population that the lake is known for. So the community that we typically think about trying to assess what the impact of invasive species on is actually not the community that was in this land lake. But our data set will, will allow us to look at this modern impacts of, of invasive species on, on, the, on the wildlife fishery that, that we all think of the wildlife lake is happening now. So the invasions that we can keep up with almost all happened as a result of and after the, the implement or the installation of the canal system, allowing that, that free passage for fish that were in the Great Lakes and decided they wanted to, to move inland and see what was going on to get there. And I put this in the context of the, one of the other activities that humans seem to be perpetually eager to be involved in, and that's military action. So in, in the War of 1812, Oneida Lake was in its original state and everything was fine. By the time we got to the, the War of Northern Aggression, we had the canal system in place and provided access for fish in the Great Lakes to start moving inland to see what they were up to. By the time we got to World War I, we had put Oneida Lake in the middle of that canal system so that 
every invasive species would have an opportunity to drop by the U.S. and decide whether or not that was something they wanted to stay. A fairly <laughs> steady flow of invasive species through World War II and the Korean War when we started controlling water levels to, to control the natural productivity of the lake to make it better for more pelagic species. And then, I guess in 25 years or so, we've been involved in endeavors over in the Middle East that I can't, I, I, I don't know what to call them right now. But that's the area where suddenly we, we start thinking more about aquatic invasive species. We go up to a bunch of swell acronyms. The public starts to talk about it. The politicians start to talk about it. And the awareness is escalating to the point where we're in a position to talk about controlling things a little bit. And I think it doesn't take much to argue that the, the timing's not great. But if we got to that point where we worried about these things back there when they first started, rather than 120 years later, we might be in a better position. But circumstances are what they are. A brief history of what has come into the lake and to the best of our ability when it came. Not a whole lot of science going on in the 1800s. We know Adams and Hankinson gave us the first survey, so a lot of the stuff we just know it was there when people started looking at it. We had Phragmites, we had we had milfoil, we had purple loose stripe, we had all of that stuff when first surveys were done. And then more recently we have had the European frog bit, the water chestnut, and the, the starry stonework have gotten into the lake. When Baker conducted his first studies of the invertebrates and mosque in the lake, we had the two elamias and one horned snail. His second survey, two years later, turned out the European faucet snail, which is giving credit for wiping out those three. Pink gill splitter showed up in, in the middle of the century, and then more recently, the, the ones that we all talk about, the zebra mussel, European mouse snail, and fog mussel. I'm surprised no one's mentioned it, but people keep asking, how can we control zebra mussels? Well, I think we all know you introduce fog mussels. They have almost completely displaced <laughs> zebra mussels in our lake, and, and most everywhere else they go. So that, that one's kind of a no-brainer. In, in terms of crustacea, we had, we had an exotic amphipod that was there from the very early days. It blossomed when the hexagenia kind of disappeared from the lake and is our primary and most abundant amphipod. They're very important to food for most of our fishes, a species of Eubos mina. Rusty crayfish first identified in 2005, probably got the brother in that. That's one species we've not. Crayfish surveys are not something we spend a lot of time on. The kind of gamorous there and hemimysis just a few years ago. In terms of fish, the very first surveys, we had carp, we had alewife, we had sea lamprey. There's some debate about whether sea lamprey are native to this neck of the woods or not native, but I won't get into that. But this is an opportunity to point out that it's not all ballast water and that kind of stuff. A lot of the problems with invasive non-native fish species started in 1871 when the U.S. Commission of Fish and Fisheries formed, immediately after the Transcontinental Railroad was completed, and then we started hauling fish back and forth from coast to coast and stocking them willy-nilly everywhere we wanted to. So a lot of this is intentional. So we can say, well, we didn't have any invasive species until we had the canal, but actually we did. We had carp brought over from Europe by popular demand, and there's another lesson there. The public, in fact, insisted that carp be brought over. Now, 100, 200 years later, we're not so sure that's a good idea, which means that, that if you have a problem with stakeholders, if you wait 100 years, they'll change their mind, but, <laughs> but they're there. And then in the 1950s, we get gizzard shad and white perch who are still persistent there, a brief blip of rainbow trout showing up in the lake, but then they disappeared. More recently, the rudd in the late 90s and blueback herring, which was kind of come and go. We see them here and there, but they've never really established. And then in the very modern era, we have the papu, only one of those, but I put that up there because I think Frank Clack was furious when I put it on the invasive species reporting page, but it washed up on one of our boat ramps. No one thinks for a second papu can establish a tropical species in a lake like the Lake, but it is evidence that we have knuckleheads who are still dumping their aquarium fish in the lake, and at some point they're going to make a difference. The snakeheads we also don't have there, but that's an example of fish that we don't have, but the public's convinced we do have, or at least a chunk of the public is. We, you, know, you, you put a fish like this in a pond just outside of Washington, D.C., you get a bunch of national press about the fact that they can fly, crawl on the ground, eat green hair, and all that kind of stuff, and people get worked up. So we get regular reports on these since about 2000, shortly after the big Crofton event. But we have a subspecies snakehead that turns into both in whenever photographed. So right now, <laughs> but, but certainly there's concern locally because we have a lot. We get a reported lot. And then of course around Gobi, who took its sweet time getting up there, but it finally showed up in the lake, reported by anglers in 2013. And last summer, 
we caught them ourselves in the lake, and, and they've spread pretty rapidly. We can only find them in the West End early in the summer, and then in the summer, we catch them in falls in the lake. So they're, they're there. And when we're looking forward to studying, that's going to be our, our argument for the need for continued funding from the LC. And I know this one's not, I don't even know if cormorants are considered an AIS or not, but, but they do spend a lot of time in the water, they eat a lot of fish, and if we talk about non-native critters in an island lake, we have to include cormorants in that list of things that we talked about. They started nesting in the lake in, in 1984. So that whole long list, there's only a handful that we think have been successful enough to create large populations. And, and, and have demonstrable impacts on, on what's going on in the lake, and that's these two muscle species, cormorants, the, the white perch, and the gizzard shed. For the zebra mussels and fog mussels, I'll talk about them, the same thing. This is pretty well studied. Everybody knows the routine. They get in your lake, they filter phytoplankton, the water clears, sunlight penetrates deeper, and that allows their aquatic microphytes throughout the deeper depths. And that's exactly what we saw in our lake. Chlorophyll, a measure of phytoplankton productivity, dropped off dramatically after the zebra mussels got in the lake. Water clarity jumped up, so all that stuff happened just as predicted. We took a lake that historically was considered eutrophic and take these indicators, second disc and chlorophyll A, and actually drop it down to either mesotrophic or, or high level oligotrophic. I think now we call it mesotrophic, but the, essentially the productivity of the lake has been changed by a lot of which is, of course, a, a dramatic impact. As predicted, as the light penetration increases, the depth to which the aquatic macrophytes can establish increases. We've had almost a tripling of the depth at which plants can grow, it went from like two or three feet to now, well, I think 15 or 18 feet, or the plants are capable of getting out to. That's had some impact on landowners when they have plants run up through the docks. But all that stuff is, is what you expect to happen. This is a large lake, and clearly everything that you worry about with the muscles getting in your lake has, in fact, occurred. The next step would be declines in zooplankton in response to reduced phytoplankton availability. And for whatever reason, I might have that lagged behind. It took a while, but starting in about the early 2000s, we do start to see sharp declines in zooplankton abundance, particularly daphnia, which has implications for, for, for young fish that are dependent on, on zooplankton, particularly daphnia, for, for their feeding and growth. I do need to point out we can't discount the additional influence of the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement back in early when did that happen? Nixon signed it, so it had to happen before Watergate. That would be 72. 72, good, thank you. So, but the timing of everything changed is more consistent with when the muscles got in than, than when, when legislation reduced nutrients. But both of those things are happening at the same time. So the muscle story is pretty easy to tell. Nobody's going to argue with it because it's what we've seen everywhere they've gone. Some of the impacts have not been quite as obvious as we'd like, and that is, might be ideal for, for presentation. The white perch and the gizzard shed, we know they have a role in the lake. We're not sure how big or how dramatic it is. One thing we can say in favor of gizzard shed is that it was them that started the field section. So in the 1950s, gizzard shed showed up for the first time. While I catch rates declined a little bit, and the locals, who most people who are familiar with them know, are quite vociferous when they concern their displeasure about things. Said something needs to be done. Someone at Cornell suggested John Forney, who had become the first director of the station, I think, and donated to Cornell in 1957, that he put a proposal into New York, D.C. for a three-year study to see what was up between the Gizzard Chat and the Walleye. <coughs> this year, we're starting another five-year segment of that three-year study because we think we're just about to tie things up. But the Gizzard Chat. <laughs> In fact, started all this, and we have to be grateful to it for that. The shed kind of bounced around. It went away in terms of being a big player in the system pretty quickly after John Sturr's research, and then kind of cropped back up in the last half of the last century. We didn't have good measures until acoustics came on board when Lars started in the 1990s, but it's only been the last decade or two that they've consistently reproduced successfully every single summer and, and produced big year classes. So while they've been there the whole time, it's only recently, presumably because of climate, or at least partly because of climate, that they've started to, to be a little bit more successful. Now, I probably don't need to tell you that I come from the south, so I'm familiar with this species and its native range. Turns out Oneida is at the very northern edge of where gizzard shad can live. So a lot of concerns about shad that, that, that we had down south, we don't have up here. They can, in fact, in southern reservoirs, represent 50% or more of the total fish biomass. They, they grow pretty quickly, so they're good food for plastic their first year of life, after which they're essentially immune to predation, and then they just 
huge, form huge populations, eat sediments, which stirs up water, freeze <coughs> nutrients, and that kind of thing. So they're, they're kind of like carp in that sense. So they're, they're kind of a, a hassle down south where they're highly abundant. What happens here is they, they spawn in the late summer. They provide excellent food for walleye in the, in the late summer and early fall. Those fish that don't get eaten typically winter kill because it's too cold for them up here. Very few survive enough to reproduce, but we don't have a big growing population. Turns out our studies of cormorant diet show that they prefer soft-bodied schooling fish with skizzard sad barb. So that's not a bad thing. So they may well actually serve a viable role as a buffer for yellow perch against walleye predation. They're another food source out there. And they could distract cormorants from their, their preferred path of evil by eating the sport <laughs> fish. Stuff. So here's a fish that doesn't belong here, but as far as we can tell, its current role is, is if anything, beneficial. White perch are a little bit different story. They were here all along as well, but bounced around to very low numbers throughout most of the 40s years. Leaped up to incredibly high densities in the, in the early 80s, and then a disease that was specific to white perch set in, pretty much wiped out the population. It's just now growing back to the area, the level it was at back in the 1980s. In our gillnet catches, at least, white perch outnumber yellow perch in, in several of the most recent years, meaning they may well be the most abundant fish in the lake right now, a species that doesn't belong here. This is one. I should point out, did not come from the Great Lakes of the canal, it came from the other direction. <coughs> concerns about white perch, their diets overlap enormously with yellow perch, so the concerns most of the places where they show up is they're going to compete with yellow perch and, and, and be detrimental to them. So far, we've found both species to be extremely plastic in their diets. The growth rates of neither species shows any decline in terms of competition, so at present, we don't think that the white perch are a negative as far as the yellow perch go but time will tell if their density continues to grow. So the impacts of cormorants are, are a bit more conspicuous. They're not very popular, but we have this kind of stuff going on. So here's our, here's our walleye population in, in orange or red. Popping along during the, the good old 40 years, it, it, you know, just under a million fish out there in the lake. And then the cormorants come in and drops down about 250,000 fish. The yellow perch population, 4 million or so, dropping down to about a million. All of that concurrent with the increase in the, the, the predation pressure of cormorants on the lake. There's several species of cormorants worldwide. The one thing they all share is that whenever they interact with anglers or commercial fisher folks, they are loath and despised. Our guys were <coughs> no, no exception. The minute they got there and there's some sense that they might impact the log fisheries, we got this kind of rhetoric from our local lake association. And another byproduct from that makes that we're non-native at least is that the association itself is now worried on becoming a nuisance species from the agency's perspective because of their continual demands for more and more resources being expended in order to keep the single bird off the lake at all costs. And, and I do mean at all costs, they, they do not go over there. All of that led to a, a fairly aggressive management program for cormorants that went into place starting in the 2000s, started limiting the number of successful nests, then started with hazing the, the fall migrants. We had about seven, 800 birds that would reside on the lake during the nesting season, then we would capture the migrants from Lake Ontario, we'd come down and get up to maybe 2,000 birds. So there's first nest control, then the fall migration control, and then sometime in the early 2000s, we got some earmark money through for Representative Walsh, who actually create a wildlife services office on the west shore of that lake, and, and their entire job is to keep these birds off the lake, and, and they did that. So the populations of cormorants were driven down to almost nothing, the predation pressure to almost nothing. And, and what we see is that the yellow perch population did, didn't really respond that much to the cormorants being removed. The wall bumped up for a little bit, and, and then it leveled out, but it levels well below historic levels. And there's some to made that this, this immediate increase after the cormorant hazing had more to do with regulation changes after the immediate crisis of walleyes noticed in the actual cormorant case. Not to say cormorants didn't have an impact, but there were other things going on. So if we try to look at the invasive species one at a time, we get kind of muddled with all the stuff changing at the same time. So we, we would like to try to look at things happening together to see whether or not the, the synergy between this and that invasive species or this and that process might be easier to help us understand what's going on. At the same time, the adult population dropped down our production of juveniles. The young of year fish surviving through the fall also is fine for both yellow perch and walleye. We cannot blame this on cormorants. They don't eat fish at those small sizes. Initially, we didn't want to blame it on white perch. I didn't want to. It was difficult to blame it on white perch. 
because white perch were at very high densities in the 80s, and we still had good production and survival of juvenile perches at that time. And when the perch disappeared in the early 90s, we didn't see a big spike. So the initial circumstantial evidence would say, well, it must not be perch. But then we think about the fact that the perch got out there at about the same time the water, the second era of perch occurred at about the same time the water quality cleared. The perch do, in fact, eat larval fish. They're not alone in that activity. The, the walleye and perch themselves will eat their own young in the larval stage. And several other species will, but you put perch in. You take a, you know, a perch population, a white yellow perch population of 2 million, tack on 2 million white perch, you don't need an AIC model to say, well, there's a lot more larval predation out there, and maybe that's an issue. Then you combine it with the fact that the late historic days like this, the turbidity itself, quite a good cover for larval fish, larval walleye, are in fact evolved and adapted to these kind of murky waters. You put in mussels, you clear it up, and suddenly they lose that cover, and then predation pressure may well pop up. So we think that if you take the combination of the mussels clearing the lake, white perch adding a, a very abundant additional larval predator to the lake, then, then we wind up the situation where it could in fact be that our larval person survival is now a fine point that we cannot have the, the adult population we used to have just because we're having a bottleneck at the young year stage. And I think I have to point out, since we're talking about exotic species, <laughs> Lawrence Rustam, who is currently the director of the station, came over from Sweden to start with the station in 1992, and that just for your reference in terms of what the walleye population has done. <laughs> <laughs> The causal mechanisms are not so clear, but she makes that timing is really, really attractive to, 